you know, my talk today was, was I was going to try and talk about transitioning man's, you know, the, the, bi, the clam fishery. Basically, I said I put bivalves on there, but I was going to try and focus on this, you know, the municipal programs and the shell fishery, um, the soft shell clam fishery um, that I'm familiar with. And I've been, I've been able to go up and down the coast over the, the last decade or so, and I've become familiar with a lot of different programs and met a lot of great people, and I see some here today. And uh, I did, you know, one, this, is, this is my first slide, and I did, this is the one slide that I didn't really work on, um, and, I, and I, I should have because I, one of my friends in the audience here, Glenn Melvin, he told me that fax is a four-letter word in the, in the shellfish business, so um, I, didn't, I couldn't come up with a better term, and, I, and, I, and that was on the, the agenda, so I, I left it anyways. So how do I, how do I just... Just arrow down. There we go. And for this talk, I wanted to you know, just basically to quickly define um, what shellfish management or conservation is. And for the purposes of, of where I'm coming from, um, I consider that an activity uh, that sustains or increases shellfish production. And I know that you know, there's a lot of, um, well, I'll give you the, but there's a lot of different you know, aspects to you know, what people think of what is conservation or whatever, but this is uh, basically the definition from my perspective. And then, you know, I wanted to define myth. And, you know, myth is, is a, a widely held but false pity for idea. And that's, that's what I was going to, you know, that's my definition for this particular talk. Um, examples of myths commonly found within the main shellfish industry uh, that overfishing is the reason commercial populations of clams have declined. Um, another one that I, I, I've become familiar with in the last couple of years is that green crabs are gone because, you know, you go to a shellfish meeting and clams, geez, I haven't seen a green crab for, you know, two years. Or I saw one this year. They're, they're gone. Well, you know, we, that, we know that's a myth. And so the green crabs are gone just because clams don't see them. And, that, you know, we still have people that think clams pot repopulate the flats that they're in that they live in, and that clam populations are, are cyclic or are part of a, you know, some sort of cycle. And you know, as far as overfishing, um, you know, this, that, the, the clamor on the, on the right is Jim Harriman. I see him in the audience, and if there ever was a case for overfishing, it probably would be him. But, um, you know, a lot of us, you know, including myself, I mean, I, I, I always thought that, you know, the clamors were the, we got the clams, not, not other creatures, but uh, I've since learned that uh, that's not necessarily the case. And, and that there's, you know, there's basically a growing amount of evidence uh, from, of, of applied marine research that, you know, continues to inform us that juvenile shellfish is still settling, you know, along most of the coast and in high densities in a lot of areas. Uh, we know that uh, metabolism rates of invertebrate predators like green crabs rise and fall along with water temperatures. We saw that earlier with, with Brian's slide uh, from Appen's talk. And uh, uh, we know that, you know, that, that according to NOAA, that Maine is, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. I know Glenn may, may think that, you know, he doesn't want to use the word fact, but, you know, from what, from what I've been reading, that's a fact. Um, so basically, in, conclu in conclusion, you know, and, and also, you know, we, we also heard earlier today, like with Ab, and I think Brian mentioned it in his talk about the two-inch laws, that, you know, there's only, there's only approximately 1,500 clamors today, licensed clamors, compared with, you know, 6,500 in the 70s. So, you know, really, if overfishing um, was an issue, you know, that, you know, you would think that there'd be a lot of harvesters out there, and that's not the case. And, you know, so the conclusion is that all, all this stuff adds up and suggests that, that really, you know, increased predation resulting from warming ocean temperatures is the primary cause, you know, of declining harvestable shellfish stocks. I and mean, it's not overfishing. Um, myth number two would be green crabs are gone because we don't, because clamors aren't, don't see them. One thing I did learn, I've had the, uh, the privilege of working with, directly with, with Brian and some other scientists in Freeport, and you know, the first year that I, that I worked in the field with him, I was really surprised because I noticed, you know, in 2013, like a lot of other people did that work on the mudflats, uh, 
you know, the flats were all pockmarked up, and you could you could literally see where um, you know the crabs were burrowing and you know doing whatever they do. And I was really surprised when I went out in the mud and I and we were trying to clean these nets off, and we were finding green crabs, and the mud was just as flat as a pancake. You literally uh, you could not you, know, you there was no way to really tell that there were crabs in the flat, and. You know, and there were there were lots of them, not just not just one or two. There were a lot of crabs in the flat. So, you know, it's it was really that was really fascinating to me to, to learn that. And so, you know, when you look at a mud flat, you know, it's, you know, most of the you know, I don't I don't know about I can't speak for every flat in the state, but it, it uh, the research shows that those flats are full of crabs, even though we can't see them and we dig through them and we still don't see a lot of crabs. And, but but they are there. Um. We know they haven't gone away. You guys have seen, I think most of the people that were here this morning saw this slide. That, you know, um, I took this from a presentation Brian gave to the Freeport Shellfish Commission, I think, in, I think last year, 2016. And, you know, the, you know we, even though we didn't see, you know, on the flats, we didn't see any crabs hardly in 2014 and 15. You know, the trapping studies indicated they were still there. And, and they, their numbers increased through the fall um, each year. So, you know, again, it's really a myth that they're gone. They're not gone, they're, they're, they're a permanent part of the, the ecosystem, and um, so that's really a myth. Um, and I know, I see Tim, Tim LaRochelle, I know we've, we, you know, he's, he's gone over, you know, gone back and forth and has some theories about, you know, ocean currents and um, stuff like that, but generally speaking, you know, we know that, you know, it's, it's, it's really a given that um, the, the amount of time that a soft shell clam spends in the water, in the water column, means that you know the currents and the tides and the, the prevailing wind direction prevent it from repopulating the flats that it, that it originated from. And you know, whether there's an exception to this rule in certain areas, I don't know. But generally speaking, um, this is this isn't the case. So a lot of people, when they say, "Geez, well, you know, you know, they're worried about you know conserving clams because they they want them to seed the flats that." You know they're in. That's that's not going to work. That's not. Gonna, and, and the problem with this is it just, um, in my opinion, it just shows. You know, it's, it demonstrates really the lack of just basic knowledge um, that a lot of us, including you know, like I said, I, I include myself in a lot of this stuff. This is a lot of this stuff I just learned over the last several years. But it's very common uh, to, to run into run into these types of myths uh, in at municipal shellfish meetings or. Uh, uh, just in the, you know, on the flats or wherever. Um, clam populations are, are cyclic. You know, I thought this one was fairly easy to, to dispel because, you know, a cycle, a cycle typically refers to something that's predictable, like a tide or uh, the sunrise and the sunset. Uh, clam landings, you know, we can't predict with any accuracy what clam landings are going to do you know, three, five, ten years, ten, ten years from now. Uh, we can make pretty good predictions based on what the water temperature was, if there's going to be survivors, but generally speaking, you know, we're not going to be able to predict uh, clam populations, you know, any length of time uh, from now. So they're really not, that's not really the definition of a cycle. Um, you know, myth, you know, management, so, you know, I, this one, I, I was going to pose it as a question, but I, I wanted to say that, you know, I was, management or conservation project, projects frequently used by main shellfish programs are correlated to increased shellfish production. And, you know, so what, what do we know about this? And, and really what we know is that, you know, some examples of these conservation programs include conservation closures, uh, brushing, transplanting seed, there are other things too that I left off the list because, you know, when it comes to the definition of management, I mean, it's just, it's just so obvious that it's not management that um, I, I didn't even include them. Uh, so, you know, DMR, you know, does not require municipal programs to assess, you know, management of conservation projects or activities to determine whether they are correlated with increased shellfish production. You know, there's really not a lot of data out there on whether a lot of these activities actually work to do that. And DMR itself is not assessed and does not know whether any of these programs are correlated with increased shellfish production. 
And this is not something that, you know, this isn't a new thing. And this has been going, you know, everything was going well until, you know, things really warmed up around 2008, I think, 2008, 2009, and, and landings really, you know, started dropping in a lot of areas. And, you know, it really caused people, and some people anyways, to say, geez, you know, well, you know, what's going on? You know, we've, we've been doing conservation. You know, we brush, we seed, we, we do all these things. Why, you know, why are, why are we digging any clams? So um, I think that the, it's just become more highlighted with the, you know, the, the more dramatic changes we've seen in the resource itself. And, uh, you know, so, you know, so again, I, before, I, before I move this over, it's, it's really, you know, we don't really know you know, we don't, I don't really, I can't really say for the certain if it's a myth that man, some of these management <coughs> or conservation projects work because we don't have the data to, 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 to know if they do. But this is what we do know about conservation closures is that they falsely assume that overfishing is the primary cause of shellfish mortality. Um, and, I, and, I, and I took this, this uh, this little clip out of the of a study that was done, that the, you know the passive use of I like that kind of <coughs> psychedelic. <laughs> okay, but but basically, you know, if it was if conservation closures really worked, it'd be really easy to to bring clam populations back to you know sustainable levels or increased levels or increased production. I mean, there's, there's thousands and thousands of acres of flats in this state that, you know, they're not producing anything. You know, if we could just close, if closing it was the answer, I mean, it, you know, we, we'd see results and, and we don't see them. And one thing I left off this was, you know, because of all the work, and, and I will say, you know, I think that you know DMR is in kind of a tough spot because you know where management falls, it's under it's it's under the, the public health division, and there's no question that you know water quality is the, the number one uh, issue for the shellfish industry. I mean, we can't we can't do anything if we don't have you know flats to dig or flats to work on or anything. So you know, but I think one thing that's really interesting is that you know when. Uh, Cole, Cole took over DMR, you know, the Water Quality Division in 2010. I mean, she implemented policies and procedures that led to, you know, a you know, huge wave of reopening of mudflats. And, you know, the landings really didn't, you know, they, they reflected it a little bit, but not, but not you know, the scope of the, of the acreage that was reclassified. You know, versus what was actually produced in plants is really, I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was something I was thinking about earlier today is that, you know, because of all the work they put, they, 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 they continue to put in, you know, we've got all these flats open, but you know, they're just not producing plants. You know, why? Brushing? You know, I, you know I, I've read, you know, just recently that, you know, there are towns even in Casco Bay that are, uh, planning on brushing, you know, their flats. We brushed flats in Freeport over the years. Again, we never assessed whether it worked or not. Uh, our measure of success is whether we did it or not. We did it. We put a, we put a lot of brush out. There. Uh, but you know what we do know is that you know again in this one you know it it's an activity that we hope will increase the number of number of settling plants, and it ignores the fact that predation is really the limiting factor in shellfish management. Transplanting seed, I, I struggled with this slide. I worked on it a little bit last night. You know, a lot of time, you know, you hear, you know, I, I heard uh, people mention it today about, you know, they've been transplanting seed. Some, some people think it works, some people don't. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know. We've, we've also done that. And, and again, didn't, didn't assess whether it worked or not. But, what I would say is that you know what you know what we do know about you know transplanting seeds. You really need to start considering the numbers. And I, and I see Kyle and Cody in the audience and from DEI and they work in the hatchery. I mean they have a they have a, a whole different perspective. And I I've had the opportunity working with Brian uh, to 
you know, to, to kind of get into that a little bit too, to have an idea of what the numbers really mean when it comes to seeding or transplanting seed. I mean, this, this, the numbers are, are mind-boggling, but what we do know about, you know, the numbers is that we know there's a thousand, uh, there's on average a thousand two-inch clams in a 50-pound in a bushel of, of soft-shell clams. And, you know, so you, you look at some of these projects, and I, I took it, I, I wanted to do a hypothetical uh, transplant project. And I, what I said, you know, because I've, I've worked with some people, I talked with some people recently uh, from the Thomaston area, and they, they wanted, they said, geez, you know, we do a lot of, we do a lot of reseeding. You know, we transplant a lot of seed, and, and it's really, it's, it's the difference for us. And, you know, I didn't really want to, you know, so I, I started thinking about, you know, the numbers, again, with, with transplanting seed. And when you do that, um, you know, for example, I, I, you know, hypothetically, I said, let's say 35, you know, clamors, the 20 bushel or 1,000 pounds of three-quarter inch, which, and I put parentheses, unrealistically small because three-quarters of an inch clam is very small for someone to dig, you know, for every clam to be three-quarters of an inch. It's very difficult. I, I would say, I would generally say nearly impossible. And so you know, it's very small. An inch clam is really small. Three quarter inch clam is really small. So you know, hypothetically, if we assume that they dug three quarter inch clams, you know, so so then we consider then we have to consider that, that most of these programs they're taking clams, they're tra they're digging them in the high intertidal area where we know the predation is lower, and they're transporting them to flats in the low intertidal, the mid or the low, where we know its predation's higher. So, there's a reason the clams are in the high to begin with, to, to dig for transplant, and there wasn't any clams in the low to begin with, but we're taking them from the high, we're moving them to the low. So, and is that, is, 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 am I making any sense to you? Yeah. So anyway, so 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 again, you know, so it's it's a little also assume that uh, we'll give them an unrealistic, unrealistically high survival rate of fifty percent, and then we'll also assume unrealistically that the clamors harvest. <coughs> all of the clams that were planted, because that's not going to happen because, you know, just the, the act of digging clams, you don't get them all. You, you, you kill some, you miss some. But let's just assume we get all of them. If we move 20 bushel of three quarter inch clams, at the end of it, if they are, you know, 50% live, we end up with 150 bushel of clams which may sound like a lot of clams, but you know, in the big picture, it's, it's really, it wouldn't even support a clamor for a year. Not one license holder would that activity support. You know, if you've done two bushel, you know, for 175 days, you dig 350 bushel. That's not a lot of clams. Maybe it is in some areas of the state, you know, but you know, in, in a lot of areas, you know, that's really not what, you know, keeps programs alive is, you know, uh, you know, a bushel and a half or two bushel a tie. Um, so, you know, you're not even, so th this type of program takes two days, 35 people, and it doesn't produce enough clams to even support one license holder for a year, not even watch. So, you know, is this really, you know, is this something that's really worthwhile? You know, again, you know, we need to measure the, uh, the effort as well as, you know, what we get for you know in return for the numbers of clams, the effort does count. So you know what needs to happen. The first thing we need to do, really, as an industry, is accept that overfishing is not the limiting factor in shellfish management. And so you know all the regulations we come up with, or the ideas we have, you know. If the, if the focus is on overfishing as being a limited factor, it's likely, or more than likely, to fail. And we need to really start focusing our programs on, you know, activities that allow individuals to protect juvenile shellfish. We know they're settling in high densities. 
We can get them from a hatchery. We can, you know, there's... Yeah, but that's really the need. That's, gonna, that's, that's what we need to start thinking about and start doing, actually. Um, we need, and one thing I put in there, and I, and I, I know I saw Flora in the audience too, and I, I spoke with her, you know, a few weeks ago, and um, we, you know, another thing is, like, you know, one of the, the biggest limiting factor in uh, enhancing shellfish with seed is nurseries. You know, I, I, I hear, you know, I've heard people uh, say things like, you know, geez, we need to get the state hatchery, we need a state hatchery, or we need, you know, to. Um, DEI or whoever, you know, we get a hatchery to produce seeds so we can start reseeding the flats. Well, you know, DEI is, is quite a, you know, quite an operation and I think at, you know, at full production to produce only 20 to 25 billion uh, seed clams a year. And, you know, that's really, you know, when you start factoring in the mortality associated with, with uh, reseeding projects, I mean, it's, it's nothing. It's, it really, it's nothing. It's, the, the bottleneck is, is really, you know, the upwellers and the ability to, and the access to the shore and uh, we, so, you know, I put this as one of the uh, things that I thought was important is, you know, remove obstacles like LPA densities in marinas. I mean, they, they can, you can only have four within, you know, a certain distance. You know, we need, we need to start thinking, you know, where every, every, every dock that we build have the potential to be an upload. Um, and we also need to start, you know, supporting, you know, at least financially, like with Advin, I, I, I don't see him, but I, with Advin and the other legislators and, and us, you know, is really, we really support applied marine research. You know, so we can continue to understand what's actually happening out there. And when I say applied, you know, applied is the key word because it's really about, you know, commercial scale research. It's not about, you know, figuring out if the, you know, why the, the color of this clam is different than that, than that clam. It's, it's more about, you know, how can we get people out there working and making money? How can, clam, how can we get increased survival of clams? And then also, the last thing I wanted to mention is that you know, we need to establish processes that effectively communicate, you know, updated information, you know, to DMR and other policymakers because, you know, I've got a, you know, I have a lot of faith in DMR and especially in the leadership that we have now that if they do have the information that they can start to make decisions that, you know, can, can change and can help people adapt. And, you know, so but it, it's, it's really, you know, I'm not the, you know, I, I, I have a, diff a difficult time communicating with anybody, let alone, you know, a, a state agency. But I, what I'm saying is that we really need to figure out ways that, of the information that we do have, how can we get it out to people, or how can people access it, especially, um, keep, you know, the, the people in charge and the people that can make a difference. So that's, that's pretty much it.